Thank you, Mark. How are we doing this morning? How many of you are blessed to be in the house of the Lord? Amen? Praise God. Well, I have the privilege, like Mark mentioned, of following up with the series of teachings that we had the last couple of weeks. How many were blessed when Tom and Harold brought the word over the last couple of weeks? Amen? This, uh, this posture of worship before the Lord is such an important one that we need to enter into as a church. Amen? Like, this is what God has called us to live into, to where it's like, ultimately, it's the created in line with the creator and becoming everything that he wanted us to be. Amen? Father, I ask this morning, Father, that your, Lord, that your presence would be in this place. God, that the reality of the worship that we're called to enter into, Lord, would live and move inside of us. God, I ask, Lord, that the, the sobriety, Lord, the sobriety and the weight, Lord, of eternity would grip our hearts over again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's open up with the, the scripture out of John chapter 4. This has been the theme which we've been working out of the last couple of weeks. Let's turn to verse 23. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. An hour is coming, and now is. How many know we're living in the reality of that? The hour has come for the worshipers to arise. The hour has come for us to enter in that place of worship with the Father. And today we're going to talk about the walking out and the living in that reality of worship, right? We talked about the expression in the heart, what's coming from the deepest part, the core of our being, the core of our heart, the truest belief and desire that we have, the reality that we were created to worship God. This was placed in every heart. The scripture says that in creation, even for the unbeliever, there is the deep desire to know God, right? Right? How many of you believe that I was created to worship? I was created to have fellowship with God. I was created to have communion with God, right? And last week, Carol did a brilliant job talking about the mind, right? We must be guarded and directed in how we think and what lives in our minds. Meditation upon God's word. Meditation upon his righteousness, his holiness, his goodness, right? And so now we're going to talk about what does it mean to live in that, the follow-through of that, the lifestyle, the, the, the following through where my heart and my mind are submitted under his lordship like we were worshiping about this morning, right? Where everything inside of me is submitted to God, submitted to his lordship, submitted to his holiness, submitted to his righteousness. If you have your Bibles, let's... or technology, excuse me. We'll pull it up on the screen here, but you can turn there yourself. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is a very popular passage, which I'm sure we've all heard. We'll do verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So what is my spiritual service of worship? Ask yourself that question this morning. What is my spiritual service of worship? Quite simply, it's presenting my all in all to him. All of my being... All of my thoughts, all of my heart, all of my mind, my soul, my strength, everything that I aspire to be and become is under his lordship. It's submitted to who he is. It's my body, my life, everything. It's sacrificed on him. This is why we force ourselves to have a physical symbol of submission to God. What his hands raise mean, I surrender. Right? You look at that, in a, and not even in a, a God context. You look at that in war, right? They're putting their hands up. They're getting on their knees. If they're bowing before a king, 
or a place of authority. What does that mean? It's a place of submission unto God. It's why we do it. It's we're checking our flesh, we're checking our conscience, we're checking our mind, and we're saying, Lord, I'm choosing to submit to your lordship, recognizing his authority and his leadership. Psalms 95 verse 6 says, come, let's worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. The extent of my spiritual service of worship is the extent of what I'm willing to give him. I'm going to say that again. The extent of my spiritual service of worship is the extent of what I'm willing to give him. It's also the extent that I'm able to engage in communion with him. If my mind is not submitted to the Lord, my mind can't engage in communion with God. If when I worship, I'm worshiping other idols and other things and other areas of my life, how can I engage in perfect communion through my worship? Come on now, I can get practical. If my finances aren't submitted unto God, how can I be able to engage in communion, an area of my finances, and receive favor and blessing in that area? The extent of which I submit under his lordship is the extent which I can engage in that level of communion. Psalms chapter 16, verse 7 through 11. I will bless the Lord who has advised me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. I love the, 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 the active way they used. It wasn't I continued or it's no, I am continually setting the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, okay, remember we talked about the heart last week. Therefore, my heart is glad. Why? Because I continually set the Lord before me. It's very important that we read it in that order. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And I love this part. You will make known the way of life. Not me. Because I have set the Lord continually, I'm continuing to set the Lord before me, he will make known to me the way of life. And there, think about that, in that place of communion, in that place of him making himself known to me and me being known to him in his presence, is where I find fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. <laughs> so let's sum that up with what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. My heart is glad and rejoices. The Lord advises and instructs my mind. You will make known to me the way of life. How? <laughs> I continually set the Lord before me. That's a lifestyle of worship. Setting the Lord continually before me day by day. I wasn't going to get out of this message in this church without bringing up Genesis 3, so this Sunday won't be an exception. Right? But it's a perfect, it's a perfect example. Right? Creation made. Man and woman made. Perfect communion between them and God. Nothing separating. This concept of the Lord walking through in the cool of the day really shook me the other week when I began to dwell on it and meditate on it. Because so many times when we think about worship unto God, we think about, oh, the formality of, you know, we're coming in and we're lifting our hands. The formality of, I'm on my knees before the Lord and, and I'm worshiping. The formality of, of moments and postures. And it's right, those things are good, like we talked about. We're checking our bodies, we're checking our minds, saying, well, Lord, I'm submitting to it. But I began to dwell on this communion that Adam and Eve had in the garden with God. And if you read the beginning of the book of Genesis, there weren't mentions of external manifestations. Right? I oftentimes, I, 
I'm guilty of this to where it's like, I'm, it's like, okay, well, you know, if I, if I do this long enough or if I press in long enough, then somehow it'll get there. But if you read in Genesis chapter 3, it said Adam and Eve were just tending to the garden. They were tending to what God had gave them. I'm not going to spoil Mark's message on stewardship next week, but they were doing exactly what God told them to do. And what happened? Their heart was set on the Father. Their mind was set on the Father. Their actions reflected that of the Father's will. So what did that mean? There was a continuation of the Lord walking through in the cool of the day, which was ministering to them in what they were doing. Not just in the formality of a moment, not just in a meeting, not just in a song session or a teaching. It was the continuation of the Lord grazing by them, ministering to their humanity, communion with the Father. They were living in that. I tell you what, more than formality of moments, I want to live and constant communion with God. It's the desire of my heart. Lord, that I would know you and that you would make yourself known. Mm. So what was the doorway in a separation which caused them to grow distant from God? The serpent was cunning, yes. That's its own message. But the important piece that we're going to focus on today is they try to ration with their dualist-natured concepts and ideas. They try to question what God told them. They try to make sense of what the flesh wanted and their motives, and they try to, to fit it all together into one paradigm to where they could keep their communion with God, where they could keep the intimacy, where they could keep the walk, but also inject this longing that they had. It wasn't that they were trying to separate it. The desire of man was that they could fit it into one paradigm, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was both good and evil, right? It was the knowledge of all of it. And what man thought that he could do, and what we think we can do today is that we can ration our motives into the paradigm of communion and what God wants us to live in. Right? I don't think there is anyone on earth that truly would believe and confess that they want to separate themselves from the goodness of God. People want peace. People want joy. People want life. They want, they want happiness. They want all these things. And we all believe that only comes from God, right? So that's not the problem. The issue is we also want the desires of our flesh. We want the desires that we have, our motives, our agendas, and these things. And we try to capture this into this one image of our life. I want to enjoy the pros of being close to God, but I also want to please the pros and the, the desires of my flesh. Right? And yes, this applies to immorality, which speaks for itself throughout the word. But what if it's deeper than that? What if it's areas of my life that are unsubmitted to God? Where it's things in my past that I like to think about. Come on now where it's pain I experience from other people that I like to bring back up and I I like to say, oh, well, I'm this way because this happened. Trying to fit it somehow into this picture of my life. There can be no dualism in communion with God. God will ask us to leave these things at the door before entering into that place. Why? Because in his holy place, there can be no sin. In his holy place, there can be no mixture. In his holy place, there can be no compromise. In an ungoverned mind, hear me this morning, an ungoverned mind, an ungoverned heart will rob you of communion with God. 
it will rob you. And this is, this is so important because the devil, and this is where the devil comes in here. The devil will try to convince you, just like the serpent, that the reason you can't enter that place of communion with God is external from you. Hmm. Your father treated you that way. That way you'll never be worthy. Your past, you, you messed up, you did this, and so you can't enter into that place. It'll try to use all these external agendas, or, oh, you made this mistake, or you're not qualified, or you're not worthy, to try to get you to miss that place of communion with God. But a submitted life under his lordship is a life that can engage in communion. So how do we identify ourselves? How do we identify the life I live? How do we identify our walk with God? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. All things are permitted for me, but not all things are of benefit. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Being master means taking on the identity of. If I want to be something, if I want to do something, if I want to become something, if I am letting that overrule my mind and my heart, then I'm a slave to it. I'm no longer submitted under his lordship. I am submitted to the desire of my flesh. It's a real thing. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. However, God will do away with both of them. But the body, listen to this, is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. My body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for my body. I love that. Meaning that my body was created for worship. My body is dependent on the Lord. Which means my life, ultimately, is submitted under his lordship. Right? Right? Say that. Say, my body is for the Lord. And the Lord is for my body. True worship cannot have underlying motive or dualism in it. It can't. We must have communion with the Father. We must have absolutes with both ourselves and God. To where when we say, Lord, I'm submitted to you, we have to live in that. <laughs> because the insides and in our reality is what matters and what is real. <laughs> you can bow all you want, you can lay on your face all you want, but until you have a submitted life unto God, you cannot enter in into communion. You cannot experience the grace of God walking through your life in the cool of the day. You cannot experience the fullness of what God wants to give you. A two-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Lord, let us live in the reality of that. Let us approach it with great fear and trembling. James chapter 5, verse 12. But above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you do not fall under judgment. Mm. The fear of the Lord is truly what lays the boundaries of our path. We are so guilty of this, especially in, in our modern day society. We Paint God as this ooey gooey fluff ball of marshmallow. <laughs> He's a good father, which he is. He also opened up the earth and swallowed people. He also kept the sun up and stopped its rotation. Or excuse me, let me not mess up the science of that. Stopped the earth to where it was not rotating around the sun. The one who's the Alpha and the Omega who created us, the beginning and the end. There is authority 
and understanding the nature of our God. And this is who we're submitted to. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, being of always of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. But we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. And this is the weight of the fear of the Lord. For we must all, all, all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body, in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. It's a real thing, in case you didn't know. (laughs) That's going to happen. Why? Because you were created to worship. Simple. You were created to worship God. You were created to walk in communion with him. Your body, literally, the bane of your existence was created to worship God. Your body as a living and holy sacrifice, your spiritual service of worship, that which is who you are, is our act of service and worship unto the Lord. When I choose to surrender my heart, my mind, and my body, I no longer submit myself under the leading of my own desires. Lord, we want to submit under your lordship. When we are unsubmitted to God, we are under the consequences of our sin. We're under the consequences of our actions, not because it is God striking us with anger, but it is because we are drawing back from that place of communion with God. We must all give it an account. I know this is heavy this morning, but it's real. I know it's heavy, but you're not going to hear this out in the world. Why? Because as a, as a society, as a country, as a nation, we are driving further and further and further away from God. And the truth of what the word of God says about the end all game, which we will stand before God and give an account, that message is not living in the church today. I'm going to say it straightforward. There is such a dualism which is working in the church in this land where there is so much sin and compromise which is driving the people of God from a place of communion. Why are we not hearing God's voice? Why do we not see miracle signs and wonders? Why do we not see the outpouring of the Spirit of God? We're not close enough to him. Why? Because the sin of man is corrupting the hearts of the church. It's pulling us away. It's leading us out of the the metaphorical garden. We must fear him again. We must surrender to his lordship again. Jason would come. I was going to close here with this. We need to be honest and ask ourselves real questions this morning. What is our sin really robbing us from? What is the struggle of our mind really robbing us from? What is the interior motive and desires of our heart robbing us from?
What's preventing us from entering into that real place of worship and communion with God? Every person here, if we just close our eyes for a moment and just ask ourselves that question. God, what is keeping me from entering into communion with you? Because here's my true and honest belief this morning. If we would be real with God, if we would be willing to put everything on the table, he would show us exactly that which is keeping us from entering that place with him. Some of you have been wanting peace for a long time. Some of you have been wanting joy for a long time. Some of you have been wanting to enter into your next day for a long time. The Lord's here this morning reminding that every plan and purpose he has for you hasn't changed. But he's going to require that you leave certain things at the door before entering into it. Because that which is an idol in your life, that which is consuming your thoughts, that which is consuming your heart, that which is driving your motives and your ideas and your decisions, those areas that are not submitted unto God are going to rob you of entering into a lifestyle of worship and a place of communion with Him. That's a desire of your heart. If you could just repeat this, say, Lord, this morning, I give you permission to analyze my heart, my mind, my body, all over again. I was created to worship. I was created to know you. I was created to have communion with you. Some of you might have to say this, say, I remind myself this morning. <laughs> I was created to be close to you. Search our hearts again this morning. Search our minds again. Father, we thank you, Lord, here today. God, for your word and your presence. That, God, you have taught us, God, not to to protect our minds, God, and to govern our minds and our hearts. As we protect our minds, as we govern our minds and our hearts, God, Lord, we know that you would be the focus, and so we enter into that. We want communion with you, and we thank you, God. God, that as we're laying down the things that are that perhaps we have laid higher than you, God, that we have made priority over you, God. Lord, we, we repent of that, God, and we lay it down. Father, we want to be in communion with you today. So as we go today, as we close this service up, let's go in a way that says, God, I'm going to guard my mind. I'm going to guard my heart. We want to walk out of here saying, God, I'm going to walk in communion today with you. I'm going to walk and I'm going to protect all the things. I want my lifestyle, the very essence of what I do, God, to honor and to worship you. God is Lord over all. Can you put up that scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2 real quick? close with this. Paul is saying again, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, a whole, living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. 
let's write, let's, let's screenshot that. Let's place this on our phones, on our screen covers, and on our frontlets of our eyes as we walk out of here today. Let, let present our bodies, God, as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. And I believe today everyone here wants to be acceptable to God. So as we go, let's write this on the frontlets of our eyes. Let's live it out this week. Amen? Amen. You can be dismissed, but also this altar is always open. If you have to go and you want to go, you're dismissed, but the altar is always open. presence of God here still. And that's okay. Can we stand to our feet? One of the reasons we're not leaving yet is because of the weight of what was shared is still in the room. And we don't feel released from it. Was very gracious to get up because if people do need to go, that was thank you for doing that, Mark. Because some of us do need to get to things, but if you're, you know, like Joshua in the tent, Moses would go out from the tent, but Joshua would stay behind. He didn't feel released to leave the tent of meeting because God was still working on him. This kind of has that atmosphere where we've been in the tent of meeting. It's an Old Testament story of when the children of Israel were living in the wilderness. They didn't have a temple, they had a tent. And it says everyone whose heart would go out to seek the Lord would go to the tent of meeting. And this is sort of that. We are in this tent of meeting atmosphere where the Lord is speaking to us. And Alex talked at length about dualism. Rationalizing while rationalizing why we get to keep things in our lives that we shouldn't or keep activities or possessions or relationships or things that we covet uh, to have and, and seek after to have and hold on to trying to make that fit in as he said into the picture God gave us there's a few things in that for one, you never want to be in a church that thinks that's a good idea and preaches dualism and accepts it and makes room for it because those churches will surely lose their lampstand and will lose their way and all the time invested will come to nothing because there's no shifting shadow in his presence. He's not a dualistic God of doing the world and his kingdom in one go, living as one thing. That's unacceptable to God. And so in our lives, the kingdom of God comes to us and begins to sift and to sort. Every day we walk with God as a disciple and we grow deeper in God. God comes to sort the dualism of loving this world and loving God, how that could live in us, both of them at the same time. The Bible says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, I cannot have a dualistic nature where I have things in my life that the Word of God would never permit, but find reasons through my human thinking and intellect or what my friends say or my culture says or my family says or what somebody else said that justifies keeping it. 
sometimes we don't even know where that dualism is. We can become so used to having things in our lives that we just think, oh, well, everyone does that. Then the Lord comes and says, hold up. Does my word say that? Things we say and repeat that sound good. Our, our grandparents said it. Our parents said it. We say it. It's just a thing we say in our family. Then the Lord says, hold up. Does my word say that? And then the lens of the scripture comes upon our lives and begins to evaluate and speak to us and to show us what he's like and what he's not like. It's amazing to me how easy we can justify keeping things, keeping mindsets, keeping practices, keeping things we get from cultures. But the Lord has no desire to be that, has no fellowship with that. Keep in mind that God has no regard, no regard for anything unlike him. Anything unlike God, he is not obligated to like it just because I do. He's not obligated to find value in it just because my culture does. He's not obligated to find worth in it just because I think it has value. He's not obligated to anything I think he should be. He has only obligated himself to that which is like him and of him and from him. And everything else he has no regard. There is no dualism in God. There is no two-sided coin in God. There is one God, one spirit, one baptism, one faith, one God who is in all and over all and all things. And the singularity of our faith produces a singularity of our lifestyle. And the Spirit of God is constantly bringing conviction to us to keep us in fellowship with God and to keep us in a singular mindset to keep us in a singular heart and to keep us in a singular word and deed lifestyle. The Holy Spirit is constantly governing us to keep us in a singular word and deed lifestyle. Father, may the conviction of the Spirit one more time settle in this room and sort in us every place we're not singular. Sword in us every place dualism can live. Lord, in a very highly politicized climate, dualism sneaks in. And other things seek in and seek to have room and have purpose that many times have nothing to do with you or your kingdom and have nothing in your word. All of that, Lord, that is such a power pulling on people right now to slip them into things, Lord, that were never intended. God, may we have a singular heart, a singular focus and a singular mouth, a singular deed life, where the things we'd be tempted to do that dishonor you, someday, knowing the fear of God, we don't want to answer for that at your throne. So we would rather shut the door to it and not engage it at all rather than having to stand before you and say, yeah, I did that. Lord, we close the door to dualistic thinking and living. We close the door to dualistic practices that your word says this is evil, but we do it anyway because, well, it's reasonable. It's not reasonable. Help us, Lord. Every time we're tempted to say, well, you know, I've had a a difficult time and I've had a a difficult season, so I need a little playtime, a little, a little side, side life over here, you know, so I got to relax. I heard a famous man of God say, the devil will relax you straight into hell. That dualism, Lord, take it out of our lives. There is no relaxing that justifies dualism. Saying one thing with my mouth, doing something else with my body. Lord, would you come minister to us, Lord. Every person in here that hears this today and says, oh God, oh God, I want to be completely authentic. We want to be completely authentic, Lord. We want to be true. 
Lord, we want a singular focus. We want our mouth to say what your word says. We want our heart to believe what your word says. Our mind to think what your word says. Our bodies to demonstrate what your word says. Lord, would you come and bring a laser sharp scalpel and begin to divide off inside of us things that are both holding us back and bringing evil into our lives and confusing those who listen to us. Oh God, have mercy on us, Lord. In the presence of God, right here, can we just begin to surrender it all again? Lord, we're heading into days where we're going to have to know your voice. We're going to have to have intimacy with you. We're going to have to have, as Alex said, deep communion with you. And anything that's clouding that, anything that's justified to be here that makes that difficult is going to cost us greatly in the days ahead because we will become dull. We will become in, uh, unable to hear your voice and to live in real faith because of the things we would permitted here to rob us. Lord, we're asking, oh God, that the conviction of the Holy Ghost would come upon us in deep ways and prepare us, Lord, for eternal things. Prepare us, Lord, for a day that's coming, even in this earth, Lord, where there will be greater struggles for the church. There'll be greater struggles for Christians to stand their ground and to not surrender and to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. Oh God, would you come and pour your spirit upon us. And Lord, for the things we don't want to do, God, give us the grace to say no to them. And the way we want to be, Lord, give us grace to become that. Everyone in here, this is the things that I don't want to do. God, get rid of them. Lord, I want to surrender them. I don't want that in my life. And the things that I want to be that my flesh is constantly struggling to have. God, would you come and pour your spirit upon us right now and give us strength and fire and zeal. Lord, to become a man of God, to become a woman of God. The Bible says we have renounced things hidden in darkness because they're shameful. Lord, right now we renounce darkness. We renounce things hidden in darkness. We renounce them, Lord. Anything that's in us, Lord, get it out of us. Get it out of us, Lord. And God, may we walk upright. Cleanse us, Lord, and we'll be cleansed. We don't want to be the kind of people that says one thing and does another. Lord, today we become singular in focus. We, we walk on a level path, not up and down, swerving around. Level, Lord. The Bible is described as a plumb line meaning what the contractor uses, using gravity, putting a weight on the end of the string and holding it up to determine what a straight line is. And everything that is askew gets realized when the plumb line's dropped. Oh God, come to our lives and drop the plumb line and show us what is truly straight. And Lord, in your presence, we'll see that which is crooked. And Lord, you will give us the grace to amend it to say, yes, Lord, I surrender that and I enter into true communion with you. In the name of Jesus, there is a sword working in this meeting right now. I'm telling you, there is a sword. When Alex began to say all that and the stuff that Mark prayed, a sword got loosed in this place. I'm prophesying to this church right now. This isn't even about me being a pastor or any of that. It's bigger than that. There's a sword loosed in this meeting right now and in this church. A sword, the sword of the Lord is moving and cutting through this church. Right now I'm seeing it go on. In the hearts of men, the hearts of women, the sword of the Lord is going forth. And it's for our blessing and for our help that it does. Lord, would the sword pierce even our own heart of the word of God and go inside and begin to separate light and darkness, begin to separate truth from lies, begin to separate righteousness from unrighteousness. Oh God, mindsets we've accepted about our identity. Lord, right now, let the sword of the Lord come and sever it. 
practices we've accepted. Lord, let the sword of the Lord come and sever it. I know right now, I'm sitting here, I can look at this right now, I'm saying to you that there is even condemnation in this room. People condemned because they know they live in a dualism they don't know how to get out of. They don't know how to get out of it and they're condemned by it. They know it's dualism and they know it's wrong, but they don't know how to be free of it. I'm saying to you today, the Spirit of God will set us free and the Word of God will set us free and the power of God will deliver us from the grip that keeps us locked into things we no longer desire. The condemnation becomes a tool to keep dragging us back like a dog to vomit. Father, I'm asking right now that forgiveness will come and reach the places in our heart where we have things we don't want to have and we don't know how to get rid of them. May the power of God come upon us and surrender. May it be surrendered, Lord, and delivered from us. The sword is in this room. Anyone here that says there's things in my life, you don't have to announce what they are. No one needs to look at you and judge you for it. But if you're here and you're saying, there are things, there are things in my life that condemn me, and I'm asking God to deliver me right now in his presence. This moment isn't going to be here in two hours. It's here right now. We're not going to miss it. The Bible says to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And right now the nearness of God is so clear. And he's able to be found. Right here, begin to just, if you're in a place where you're like, the condemnation has got to go. The things that are destroying me got to go. The things I don't want anymore, get rid of it, get it out of me. Right now, I'm going to begin to give it to God. Whatever that is in your life, begin to lift your hands and cry out to God for freedom. Right now, just begin to cry out to God to be free. Lord, right now, I surrender. Everything in my life that doesn't belong here, Lord, every temptation, every vile thing, every power of darkness, everything hidden in darkness, I renounce it. And through the blood of Jesus, I begin to be healed. Through the blood of Jesus, I begin to be whole. Through the blood of Jesus, I begin to be delivered. I take authority over every power of hell that tries to suck us down into dualism. living a double life. Some things we're even ashamed to say. Lord, we know that you see. Oh God, take it from us right here in your presence, Lord. I surrender it. I surrender everything, Lord, that doesn't belong. Every image of the past and everything in the past, I surrender it under the blood. Right now, all of those things that Alex talked about that give us an external place away from God that somehow keeps us captivated right here in the presence of God we lay that down in the presence of God at the feet of Jesus and we ask oh God to be delivered from it delivered from its grasp, delivered from its claws inside of our mind and our body lie moving in the earth from hell right now that says if you've not been delivered from it by now it must be because God made it for you and you're supposed to be this after all that's the lie if you've been a Christian a long time and you've not been able to be free of something maybe instead you're supposed to be that and instead of being delivered of it you need to find grace to become it that's a lie from hell it's a lie from hell that makes God dualistic and us dualistic God is singular and has never changed. Just because we change, that doesn't mean God has changed. Just though the earth changes, God doesn't change. Though current pop theology changes, God does not change. And there are no excuses to have things that do not belong in God's kingdom in our lives. 
Any temptation that says, well, I haven't changed, it must be of God. Right here, that's dualism. In the presence of God, say, Lord, no, you do not change. And your word is not changed, and therefore we do not change. We stay focused, and instead, we cry out again for our deliverance. Lord, would you begin to set us free from everything, oh God, that is tormenting us and dragging us down. Father, we enter into your life through the blood of Jesus right now to begin to be whole and to be set free through the power of God in the name of Jesus. I want to say that again. We enter into the presence of God to be made whole and to be set free from the evil things that are tormenting us through the power of God so that the singular life we live, we live by faith and through great joy. The earth is not going to find any joy in a compromised church. They'll find no help. They might find coffee, but they won't find help. Lord, we're asking today, oh God, that we will be so clear, so full of you, Lord, so on fire for you, so set holy on you that wherever we go, your love goes with us. And your power is there to demonstrate that love through real anointing, through real deeds of ability, through real supernatural things and, and, things, and through real practical love uh, being showed out in life, revealed out in life. Apprehend us, Lord. sword is still working. It's moving through this place. The sword is still working. You know that we're contending right now for something bigger than our own lives. We're contending to become a people that God uses. We're contending to be a church where God is pleased to dwell. We're contending to be a holy people that the devil cannot lie to and rob contending for an authenticity that the gates of hell cannot prevail against, that will have true authority and true grace to operate in the earth as God would have us, not as conventional wisdom would describe it. My God, what a privilege, Lord. Praise God. go a second time. Any person that says, I want to come and lay down dualism. I want to come and lay it down. I don't care who sees me go to the altar. I don't care. I want to meet with God. And I want God to extract out of me dualism. I want to, I want God. I don't want it. I didn't want it when I walked in here. I don't want it now. But I'm asking God's power to come upon me in this message today. Lord is working to begin to carve that out of my life and to set me free from the things I don't want to have. To minister to me in such a powerful way that I begin to be delivered in the name of Jesus. In your mercy, Lord, pour fire on us till we are one with you, one with your word, one with your spirit, one with one another. My God. In the name of Jesus. Dualism's all the rage in current Christianity. And God will have none of it. He'll have none of it. And neither will we. We love God today. How many of you say we love God today? With a whole heart. Today's a day of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what mercy does is it gives us the ability to recognize things and judge them ourselves. In the presence of God to say, Lord, I see now. Set me free, Father. Set me free, Lord, of every clutch, every hidden thing, Lord. I want to be new and I want to be true. If you heard this today and say, I can't leave. That's why he couldn't leave earlier. You heard this today say, I can't leave. It's like, I need to do business with God. Eternal things are afoot. My life is at stake. My future depends upon this.
person that has it says, I need to come and lay before God or kneel before God or stand before God, ask someone to pray for me. We're just going to open up this altar. Even if it's just one person, I just, I just know the sword is working. Today is a day of freedom. I don't know, we might not have had an altar call in a while, but there's one right here. There's a moment to come and stand before God and say, God, here it comes. I'm bringing the surrender, the surrender of all dualism. Lord, I came to be a disciple of Jesus and for all of these things to be extracted from my soul, to be extracted from my mind and to be delivered out of my body. Appetites, things I desire that I know I shouldn't, things I lust for that I shouldn't lust for, things that I get comforted by that are of no comfort in your kingdom. Lord, today I'm asking for freedom from it. I'm asking for freedom from it, Lord. I'm asking for deliverance from it. For Lord, every person that came up here, may the power of the Holy Spirit begin to descend upon them right now. May the power of the Holy Ghost come and begin to shake like a tree, shaking the root of it, dropping out all the things hiding in there that need to go now. Lord, begin to shake it violently and begin to shake loose all the torment, begin to shake loose all the double standards, begin to shake loose all the mindsets, begin to shake loose all the grip of hell and demonic spirits, begin to shake loose right now things tied to us of mindsets of our past and victimization and all of that. Shake us loose from it, Lord, in the name of Jesus so that we will be cleansed, that we will be whole and we'll be uh, free. Anyone else that says, I just, I just need this moment. I, I've got to do business with God. I've got to do business with God. I'm coming to be clear. I'm coming to be free. In the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. I just ask the leaders and those among us that lead in this church to uh, serve in this church to come and begin to pray for these people that have come up here. Just, just come and minister to them and pray for them. They're here because they're looking. Father, right now we thank you that your anointing is coming upon them. Lord, your anointing is coming upon them. Lord, your anointing. I just prophesy that your anointing is coming upon them right now. In the name of Jesus, your anointing is coming upon them right now. In the name of Jesus, supernatural ability to separate lies from truth to separate light and darkness in the name of Jesus, to separate that which is of your will and our will. Lord, where they become one in your presence. We can't help but this is a prophetic house. And the prophet's message, one of the main messages in the word of God is how long can there be two opinions? Lord, today we become singular. We become singular in the face of a society that says, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. If nothing else, Lord, we become strong in our resolve to even be more so singular. Even more so in a pursuit of real communion. Make us truly an apostolic and prophetic people. been to this altar before. You keep coming until you're free. We keep coming till we're free. We keep praying till we're free. We say this all the time. We're seeker friendly here. As long as we're seeking and thirsting and hungering for God at an altar, we will continually live there and go there until we receive all that God has promised. In the name of Jesus. Set us free. Lord, let the sword of the Lord work all week long. Lord, let the sword of the Lord work all week long. Carving in and out, Lord. And so there's a singular heart, a singular word, a singular body, a singular mindset. Where we're, where we're living in a place, Lord, where our mind is fixed upon you and stayed upon you our bodies are washed clean with pure water where our hearts Lord are so tender and sensitive we can discern and become aware of the most gentle leadings and nudgings of your spirit Lord where it's not hard to find you where we're living in you Lord and abiding
abiding in you and having our being in you. All things are possible then. Everything is possible to those who believe. Father, today we step into light where all things are possible. And instead of being condemned about our future, we have faith. I just want to say this to us. Every person here that's worried about their future, future and speaking evil about it or speaking a bunch of unbelief, that's dualism. Right now, we surrender that. Come on now, in the name of Jesus, right? Right, church? Right now, we surrender that. All language that speaks about our future like it's going to be bad or God's going to abandon us or we don't know what's going to happen to us or like somehow we're going to be left out in the cold or we're going to miss it somehow and be all messed up. Lord, your word does not say that's what you're saying over us. Your word says that you know the plans you have for us to give us a hope and a future. Today, Lord, we surrender the dualism of unbelief, saying I believe, but then saying a bunch of things as if we didn't. Lord, right here in your presence, we surrender that temptation. We surrender that desire that gives us a sick sense of comfort. We let it go. We let it go in the name of Jesus. How many of you can reckon with that right there? We let go of any naysaying future as if God has forgotten us. Lord, we believe your word that says that the path of the righteous is shining brighter and brighter like the light of of, of the sun until the full day. Oh, God, it's shining. And we'll be blessed. Can we say it together? We will be blessed. We will not be cursed. We will not be forgotten. We will not be left in the cold. We will be blessed. Our future is blessed. In Jesus' name.